What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gateway Church. So glad you're here joining us online, our Gateway Gatherings, our prison campuses. Can we give it up for everyone joining us online today? We're so glad you're with us. All right, now, my daughter's here on the front row at service today, and she's typically in children's ministry, but the reason she's here today is that in my house, we sing two songs. We sing Baby Shark and the song we're about to sing. And I don't know if they told any new parents in the room, but they get about this age, something starts called sleep regression. If you don't know what that is, just buckle up. But every couple of times in the night right now, me and my wife are getting up because my little girl who's running around right now, she wakes up and me and my wife have a moment where our mind is awake, but our body is not. And we have to literally say it to ourselves, body, you don't have a choice, wake up. And what I feel like we're about to do in this song right now is I don't know what you walked in here with. If you had a hard week, I'm with you. I get it. But here's what I also know. There has to come a point where we have to say, soul, I don't care what you're going through right now. It's time to praise. Soul, you have to remind your soul and say, hey, whatever's going on outside these doors, it's okay. The difference between God and the world is that you don't have to forget your problems in order to worship him today. So I know you weren't expecting this at the top of the service, but I feel a fresh wind coming in 2025. And I think we need to have some fun in church today. So Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise in this place today. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's worship together.
verse one through five. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I can imagine that the Lord would tell us not to forget something that he thought we might forget. What does he not want us to forget today? Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisf satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. If you just wanna bless the Lord today, will you lift your hands and we say, Lord, we will not forget. We will not forget today, Lord, we bless your name. God, you're worthy of our honor and our praise. Today as a church, God, we choose to say that you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, 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 amen. Hey, when you walked in today at the South Lake campus, you probably saw a booth outside for the King's University. Anybody from the King's University in here today? Let's go. Well, listen, we uh, wanna tell you about what God's doing in partnership with Gateway Church and the King's University. And to do that, will you help me welcome up the president of the King's University, Dr. Irene Fanbro. First and foremost, I'm Gateway. This is my home. And I want you to know that in this journey and in this season, that we had an option to pull away as the kings and say, oh, it's getting a little crunchy. Is that not the word we're in? <laughs> Are we not in a crunchy season? <laughs> it's crunchy. But God intended from our founder with Pastor Jack that the university and the local church would be in partnership together. Because we don't wanna just talk about theology, we wanna be about it. We don't wanna separate ideology from practice. So we're leaning into these hard places. We're not here just because we wanna promote something or to make another dollar, that's not it. We're here to shift the kingdom of God from heaven to earth and say, God, let's do something. We feel in alignment with the word that was spoken over this house about 10,000, 40 and younger. And I want you to see this moment. Maybe this is a season for you to go back to school. Maybe you're looking at schools. Maybe you wanna support a school that is after the now and the next generation for the global church. Because the things that are hard for church aren't stopping. This isn't the first hard thing that has happened to a church. So how can we prepare people? How can we prepare men and women for that? We wanna be here for you. We wanna be your university. And so we are grateful for you and we would love to just pray a blessing and, and just in unity together go, hey, let's do hard together. Can we do that today? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for Gateway God. I thank you for what you're doing. Father God, I thank you that their arms are open wide saying we don't know, we can't figure it out, but we're yours, Father God, we are yours. And you don't require for us to know it, you don't require for us to figure it out. You say, I'm right here with you. And so Father God, we as the King's University wanna be right here in the hard place. We're not going anywhere. And I just pray a blessing over Gateway. We thank you for them. We thank you for their support. We thank you for their authenticity in this hard season to let us into the hard place with them. I pray you would bless each and every individual here, Father God, because you are present no matter where they are in this process. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, amen. Can we give it up for Dr. Irene and the King's University? Well, hey, we have a great service today. Pastor Max Lucado's in the house bringing the word. Do me a favor, turn around to a couple of people, greet one another. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Gateway Church. My name is Ryan Warren, and I'm from right here in Dallas, Texas. I encourage anyone I come in contact with to pursue 
a higher education at the King's University. I know that the work I'm doing here uh, can be impacting people all over the globe. People in, in my classes, there are people from Israel, China, everywhere, all together, uh, seeking knowledge, seeking truth the same way. And sometimes when I'm doing my studies, I feel like it's like an extended quiet time. There'll be times I'll read something, I'll just stop. I'll just have to stop and pray in that moment and just worship because it's such incredible knowledge we're learning. Through this, I'm learning how to love my Jewish neighbors better, love my congregation better. I'm being transformed to the very likeness of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this transformation then overflows and I get to lead in the very way that I'm being transformed here at the King's. We're so glad you're here. At Gateway, we're all about people because we know that God is all about people. If you're a guest today, please know that we would love to get to know you. You can meet us in the lobby at Connect Central after service or text CONNECT to 71010. We have tons of ways for you to connect with God and with others. No matter what stage of life you're in, we believe there's something for you. Here are a few things happening we want you to know about. Giving is at the core of who God is, and we believe that we're called to reflect His heart by being givers ourselves. If you'd like to give today, you can give through our website, the mobile app, or in an envelope at any of our campuses. Remember to follow us on social media or join your campus Facebook group to stay up to date with everything that's going on. Thanks again for joining us. The key to a man's heart is through his stomach, and we take that very seriously. But here at Gateway, it's not just about food. It's also about the fellowship. We were created for community with God and each other. Something powerful happens when men come together to encourage each other, pray for one another, and worship God. Men, we need each other like we need our next meal. You can find both at our next men's breakfast. Who's hungry? <laughs> My wife, Dina, and I continue to just feel a genuine sense of gratitude for the privilege of being a part of the Gateway family uh, during these days. Um, we love you. We're so very, very impressed with the Gateway elders, pastors, but most of all, the Gateway members. You're a special people. You are. And God is doing a special work. And I've watched as you continue to just step out of the boat and walk in the direction of Jesus, even during the middle of a stormy season. God bless you. God bless you. I want us to pray. There's so much going on in, in the world these days, a hurricane uh, ravaging the East Coast and what's happening in Israel in Lebanon, we've got to just encircle everything in prayer. So Lord Jesus, have mercy, please, upon this planet of yours. It does seem like history is moving at a fast clip. We begin, Lord, asking that you would look kindly upon those who have lost homes and lost possessions, uh, those who've lost loved ones because of this hurricane. We pray, Heavenly Father, for restoration and hope and, and further protection. We pray that you would uh, be pr let the people sense your presence, Father, as they are beginning to rebuild their lives. And we pray, blessed Lord, mercy upon your land. You have commanded us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so we extend a prayer over all the people of Israel. We pray for the people of Lebanon. We pray for the people of Gaza. We pray for those who are innocent and yet victims because of where they live. We pray for those who are guilty and perpetrators that justice would come their way. And we beg a blessing, precious Lord, 
upon Israel. You were born in that land. You grew up in that land. You shed your blood in that land. You rose from the dead in that land. And we believe you'll return to that land. And so, Heavenly Father, look with mercy upon this season. And we welcome it, Lord, if this is the day that you have chosen to return and inaugurate a new era. If you're ready to call your church home, we're ready to come home. We beg you now. Lord, I'd like to pray for every person hearing my voice, that they would hear your voice. I beg blessings, dear Father, upon the lonely, upon the weary, upon the brokenhearted, upon those battling cancer, those battling depression. I beg blessings, Father God, upon those who are carrying babies in their womb or carrying uh, regret in their hearts. I pray for those who long to be married but are single, those who are married but are struggling to stay married. I pray a blessing upon the senior saints, those who are battling aging bodies, aging minds, aging memories. We are so excited to see you, Jesus. We are so excited to see you, to witness the great king of the universe and to be a part of our heavenly home. Have mercy upon us, Lord, between now and when you call us into our eternal state. Grant that we can just be faithful, that we can be strong. Thank you, Lord. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ, just Christ, and all God's people said. My wife sends her love. She really wants to be here, but you know what? When those grandkids come calling, Everybody gets bumped down the totem pole. You know, uh, when we married, I was up here, and then we had kids, and I kind of moved down and moved down and moved down. Then the kids got married, and all of a sudden, I got bumped all the way up. And then the grandkids started coming and down and down and down. So I'm living life on the low end of the totem pole. She's, she's either on grandmama duty or recovering from grandmama duty, it seems. And you grandmamas know when those grandbabies call, right? So our job is just to sugar them up and send them home. I hate to, to not be there to, to enjoy that. The main focus of my messages these days is under the title, Just Jesus. Just Jesus. And last week we pondered one of the great sermons, maybe the greatest sermon about Jesus. The sermon that Peter preached about Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Today I'd like for us to look at one of the great paragraphs ever written about Jesus, penned by the Apostle Paul. In the letter he wrote a church to a church in Rome. It reads like this, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. God has made a way to make people right with him without the law. And he has now shown us that way which the law and the prophets told us about. God makes people right with himself through their faith in Jesus Christ. I've entitled this message, Where Love and Justice Meet. Where Love and Justice Meet. And I stole that title. Well, I borrowed that title. I borrowed it from a beloved hymn that Maybe a few of you will recall, it's called Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Jesse Harris is going to minister unto us with this hymn. It's an old hymn, an old hymn. Pay special note to the final verse, because in that stanza is this sentence, O safe and happy shelter. O refuge, tried and sweet. O trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. Trysting is not a word used much these days. It's an old English word, which means place of encounter. And so the author of this hymn is inviting us to see the cross as that place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. Can God love the sinner, but still punish the sin? 
How can the mercy and the justice of God be equally expressed? Well, the answer is found beneath the cross of Jesus. If you know it, would you sing with me? glad the letter wasn't sent from heaven. It came from my automobile insurance company, my former automobile <laughs> insurance company. I didn't drop them. They dropped me. <laughs> Not because I didn't pay my premiums. I was caught up on time. Not because I failed to do some paperwork. Everything had been signed and delivered. I was dropped for making too many mistakes. The letter began <clears throat> by politely telling me that my record had been under review. Mr. Locato, <clears throat> we have secured motor vehicle records which indicate a speed violation by Max Lakato in December and January, and they nod at fault accident by Dean Lynn Lakato in December. Additional records indicate additional speed violations by Mr. Lakato in April and by Mrs. Lakato in December of the next year. <clears throat> now, I I'm the first to admit that Deanlin and I, mainly Deanlin, get a bit heavy-footed <laughs> and careless when it comes to driving. In fact, isn't that the reason that we have automobile insurance? <laughs> I mean, aren't 
the blemishes on my record, proof that I am a worthy client. <laughs> Wasn't the insurance business created for people like me? Don't my fender benders and, and bumps put food on an adjuster's table? <laughs> if not for my blunders, what would actuaries actuate? So my initial thought when receiving this letter and reading the first paragraph was, well, they want to pat me on the back. <laughs> They're impressed. They wish that all of their clients were so needy. <laughs> They're writing to congratulate me. Maybe give me an award. Maybe invite me to come to a seminar to speak to other drivers on how to drive poorly. The letter continued. <clears throat> documenting other heretofore undisclosed secrets of our past. Our records indicate that on November 18, <clears throat> we paid to fix damage to another vehicle when Max Lucado backed into another car in the parking lot. The twofold appearance of the word another Somebody's counting. <laughs> Maybe I should have urged them to read 1 Corinthians 13, 5, which says, love keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> the letter continued with yet another couplet of another's. In April, we paid to fix another vehicle. <clears throat> When Dino and Lucado hit the rear of another car at a stop sign, it wasn't her fault. She dropped something in the floor. <laughs> and when she leaned down to pick it up, her foot slipped off the brake. And honest mistake could happen to anyone. And that time that I backed into another car in a parking lot, I, I went and found the guy. I confessed. My, I thought about just driving off. I could have, but I didn't. I went and I found him. We exchanged phone numbers. I don't get credit for confessing. Has he not read for Sean 1 9? If we confess our sins, <laughs> he will forgive our sins. Don't I get some credit for being honest? Apparently not. Listen to the conclusion of this letter. In view of the above information, we are not willing to reinstate your automobile insurance policy. Mm, I groaned too. <laughs> the policy will terminate at 12.01 a.m. Standard Time, January the 4th. I'm sorry our reply could not have been more favorable. For your protection, you are urged to obtain other insurance to prevent any lapse in coverage. Does that seem odd to you? I bought insurance to cover my mistakes. Then I got dropped for making mistakes. Did I miss something? Did I miss a footnote? Did I miss some fine print in the contract? Did I miss a paragraph that read, we, the aforesaid company, will consider one Max Locato insurable until he shows himself as one who needs insurance, <laughs> upon which time his insurance will cease? No, no. They dropped me for making too many mistakes. Is that kind of like a doctor treating healthy patients only? Maybe a dentist hanging a no cavities treated sign on his or her door? Is that kind of like qualifying for a loan by proving you don't need one? Well, that's kind of what we have to do with loans, right? <laughs> what if the fire department said, I'll, I'll, I'll be in your neighborhood until you need a fire? What if the lifeguard said, I'm here to watch over you unless you start to drown? Or what if, perish the thought, Heaven had limitations on its coverage. What if you got a letter from the Pearly Gate Underwriting Division that read, Dear Mrs. Smith, 
I'm writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness. I'm sorry to inform you that you have reached your quota of sins. <laughs> our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed. That your prayer life is substandard when compared to others of like age and circumstance. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20th percentile <laughs> and that you have excessive tendencies to gossip. Because of your sins, you are a high-risk candidate for heaven. You understand that grace has its limits. Jesus sends his regrets. <laughs> and kindest regards and hopes that you'll find some other form of coverage. <laughs> many fear receiving such a letter. Many worry that they already have. I mean, if an insurance company won't cover my honest mistakes, can I really expect God to cover my periods of intentional rebellion and stubbornness? Well, Paul answers this question in what one commentary written by John Stott calls the most startling statement in Romans. God makes even evil people right in his sight. What an incredible claim. It's one thing to make good people right, to make decent people better, but Paul here is saying God can make evil people right. The high-risk client, bring them on, heaven says. How can God do this? How does God make evil people right with him? It can't come from us, right? I mean, it has to come from heaven. In fact, that's a huge point in the passage that we're studying. Let's look first at the direction of grace. Prior to this passage in Romans 3 that we're about to study, Paul has dedicated all of chapter 1 and 2 and a chunk of chapter 3 to denouncing the whole idea that we could ever save ourselves. According to Scripture, our pleas of ignorance are inexcusable. Our comparisons with others are impermissible. And then in the early part of, of Romans chapter 3, Paul points out that our religious merits, our accomplishments, our good deeds, they're unacceptable. So the conclusion is unavoidable. Self-salvation just doesn't work. But Paul has a big announcement to make, and that is that God has a way. Again, our text, God has a way. Well, we could stop right there. God has a way. And look, to make people right with him, to make people right with him without law or without a law or the law, and he has now shown us that way which the law and the prophets told us about. God makes people right with himself through their faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 21 and 22. Where we fail, God excels. Salvation comes from heaven downward. It is descended. It is lowered onto the earth. It's not earth upward. It is a gift from God. A new day from heaven will dawn upon us, was the prophecy in Luke chapter 1. Every good in action and every perfect gift is where? From God. Comes from God. So salvation is God given, God driven, God empowered, God originated. The gift is not from us to God, it is from God to us. It is not our love for God, it is God's love for us and sending His Son to be the way to take away our sins. Grace is created by God, 
It is God's idea. It is God's best idea. And it is a gift that he gives to people. On the basis of this point alone, the Christian faith is absolutely unique in comparison to any other world religion or philosophy. Maybe you're confused trying to uh, keep up with all the different religions in the world. Maybe this would help. There's really two. One that says do and one that says done. One religion, and that is every religion except biblical Christianity, says do, do more, do better, do this, do that, and maybe you will be saved. Do this and be, do this and be, do be, do be, do be, do be, do. Maybe you know the song. <laughs> biblical Christianity, on the other hand, points at the cross and says, done. It's been done. It was done by him for us, finished and accomplished by Jesus the Christ. Every other religion says, well, let's negotiate with God. If I attend church enough, if I quit cussing enough, if I go to Mecca enough, if I count my rosary beads enough, Will you then save me, bless me, help me, use me, forgive me? It's a negotiation. We understand by contrast that pure Christianity promises no whiff of negotiation whatsoever. With what do we have to negotiate? Does God really need my attendance? Does God have to have my tithe to do the work? Is God really waiting on my wisdom? Oh, I hope Lakato cracks the code on that doctrine and explains it because I don't, that doesn't happen. We have absolutely nothing to offer God. Those who have walked closely with God really got this point. And they understood that nothing in our hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Isaiah described legalism, which is the idea of saving yourself by your own good deeds. Isaiah said that our righteous acts are like filthy pieces of cloth, referring, forgive me, to menstrual cloth. Paul equated our religious achievements with that pile of stink you avoid in the cow pasture. He said, I do count them but dung. Anything we do is puny in contrast to what we need and what God offers. So we can summarize all our attempts at self-salvation with three words. We have failed. We have failed. We fall short. We have attempted to reach the moon, but we didn't even get off the ground. We've attempted to swim the Atlantic, but we didn't even get past the reef. We've attempted to scale Mount Everest, but we can't even get out of base camp, much less ascend the slope. The quest is just too great. So we don't need more supplies or equipment or muscle. What do we need then? Well, we need a helicopter. We need something from up there to come down here to lift us up. Can you hear it hovering? Paul could. He said, God has a way to make people right with him. This is God's goal for you, dear friend, to make you right with him. I hope he makes you healthy. I hope he makes you successful. I hope he makes you rich. I hope he makes you popular. I do not know if he will, but here's what he has guaranteed to do. He will make you right with him. He will make it so that when you appear before him now in your prayer and someday on the day of judgment, that he will look at you and say, we're right. It's right between us. We have resolved any conflict Any question, any issue, you are right. Can I ask you, 
Are you right with God? When we say yes to his grace, he makes us right with him because it comes from him downward. That's the direction of grace. Yet how does God do this? How does God make evil people right? Well, have you ever considered the dilemma of grace? How does God make us right with him? Well, let's go back to the insurance company. Let's ask a question. Was it unjust for them to dismiss me as a client? What do you think? No. I thought it was distasteful. <laughs> unenjoyable. Unkind. But I can't call it unfair. Right? I mean, they did do what they had told me they would do. So did our father. I mean, from the get-go, he's made this clear. He told Adam, if you ever eat fruit from that tree, you'll die. You'll die a physical death, and the relationship between us will die a relational death. No fine print, no hidden agenda, no loophole, no technicality. God has not played games with us. He has not played games with us. He has been fair ever since Eden, the garden, uh, the garden of Eden, the wages of sin have been death. And just as reckless driving has its consequences, so does reckless living. And just as I have no defense before the insurance company, I have no defense before God. My record accuses me. My past convicts me. Now, suppose the founder and the CEO of the insurance company chose to have mercy upon me. Suppose he wanted to keep me as a client because I'm so, I don't know, good looking or something. Suppose. <laughs> What's he going to do? Well, can't he just close his eyes and pretend, right? Just pretend. Kind of gloss it over. Can he take that list of all my mistakes and find a trash can or even a match and set it on fire? Can he just pretend? Can he not take my driving record and tear it up? Well, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. First, the integrity of the company would be compromised. I mean, he'd have to relax the standards of the organization, something that he's not willing to do, really should not do. The ideals of an organization are to be held up. They're too valuable to be abandoned. The company cannot abandon its precepts and maintain integrity. Also, the mistakes of the driver would be encouraged. If the insurance company told me, Max, we're, we're not serious about what we expect of you, then I wouldn't be serious about being a good driver, right? I mean, why drive carefully? If the president will dismiss my errors, then what's to keep me from driving however I want? If there's no consequence for my blunders, well, then blunder on. Is that the aim of the president? Is that, is that the goal of mercy? Does he want to create a company that has lowered standards and poor, creates poor drivers? No. So the president of the company would be faced with a dilemma. He's sitting behind his desk asking himself this question. How can I be merciful and fair at the same time? How can I at once offer grace and not endorse mistakes or to be put in biblical terms. How can God punish the sin and love the sinner? Paul made it clear that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness. So is God going to lower his standards so we can be forgiven? Is he going to look away and pretend I've never sinned? Would we want a God who altered the rules and made exceptions? No, we want a God who does not change like the shifting 
shadows. We want a God who judges all people the same way. Besides, to ignore my sin is to endorse my sin. If sin has no price, then sin on, baby. If sin brings no pain, then I'm going to do whatever I want. Is this the aim of God? To create a culture? To compromise holiness? To enable our evil? Of course not. So the question then, the dilemma of grace, how does God punish sin while loving a sinner? How is his holiness and his affection satisfied at the same time? How can he be loving and punish the sin? Is there any way God could honor the integrity of heaven without turning his back on Locato? Holiness demands that sin be punished. Mercy compels that a sinner be loved. So how can God do both? Well, the answer is in the decision of grace. The decision of grace. One more time, let's go back to that insurance executive. Imagine him inviting me into his office and saying these words, Mr. Locato, I have found a way to deal with all of your driving mistakes. I can't overlook them. To do so would be unjust. I can't pretend you didn't commit them. That would be a lie, but here's what I can do. You know what we have found? We have found a person who has a spotless record, a spotless past. I mean, not even a parking ticket, not one violation. And this person has volunteered to trade records with you. What do you think? I mean, we can take your name and we'll put it on his record. And we'll take your record and we'll put it in his file. You who did wrong will be made right. He who did right will be made wrong. And my response would be, you're kidding. You're kidding. Who would do this for me? Who is this person? To which the president says, me. Now, if you're waiting for an insurance executive <laughs> to say that, don't hold your breath. He won't. She can't. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't. I mean, who has the perfect record? But if you are wanting God to say those words... Praise to his holy name, for he has done exactly that. He has, amen, praise to his name. God was in Christ, making peace between the world and himself. Christ had no sin. God made him become sin so that in Christ we could become what? Right with God. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21. The perfect record of Jesus Christ was given to you. And the imperfect record of humanity was placed upon Christ. Jesus was not guilty, but he suffered for those who are guilty to bring you to God. As a result, God's holiness is honored. As a result, God's children are forgiven and loved. And the cross becomes that trysting place, that encounter where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. By his perfect life, Jesus fulfilled every demand and command of the law. By his death, he satisfied the demands of sin. Please remember, Jesus suffered not like a sinner, but as a sinner. 
He became sin for us. Why else would he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While hanging on the cross, Christ endured the punishment that Max deserved. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we read this scripture together? It's in Hebrews 13. It says this. Hebrews 10, verse 14, with one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Can we say that together? Hebrews 10, verse 14, with one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, I, I felt like the Lord gave me this the other day, and I didn't know why, and it, it has to do with the driving. And Pastor Max, if you're watching this, I did not get a ticket. You'd be very proud of me. But the other day I had a meeting I had to get to in Prosper. If you've never been to our Prosper campus, I mean, it, it feels like it's four hours away. <laughs> and I put my GPS on in the morning and I went um, to get in my car. I needed GPS to go everywhere. And I was an hour away. And I got in my car. I had a time I had to be there. It was an important meeting. I got in my car. I, I started driving down 114 and I hit some traffic shocking that I had some traffic on 114. And I got really frustrated because I had a time that I had to be where I needed to go. And then I looked down at my phone and I was all of a sudden relieved when I found out that the app that I was using to get to my destination had already accounted for the traffic. And because it had already accounted for the traffic, the time in which I was gonna get to my destination didn't change. And when I was listening to Pastor Max, his message, I've been someone my whole life who has heard every grace message you can hear and still for some reason it's been so hard for me to accept the fact that my, what I've done in my life has been accounted for and that it hasn't changed my destination. And what we're gonna do today to respond to this message, I'm gonna ask everybody to close your eyes. We're gonna bring the lights down a little bit in here. And we're gonna go back into a song. And regardless today, if you're dealing with the dilemma, the direction, or the decision of grace, I think our responsibility today is to accept it. That from the moment you were conceived, every mistake that you would make had already been accounted for and it hasn't changed your destination. So here's what I want us to do. We're gonna go into this song. And the way that we're gonna respond today is as this song begins to play, I, I know that today God is gonna be God, but can we accept the fact and believe that he is who he says he is? And once we get into this song, once you've come to terms, you, you feel like, hey, today I'm gonna accept this grace. I'm gonna believe. I'm gonna believe that God is who he says he is, and I am who he says I am. I just want you to stand. And once you stand, we're gonna begin to worship. And we're gonna end service today thanking the Lord for His grace, but not just thanking Him and leaving, but thanking Him and receiving it. So Lord, today as we sing this song, God, I thank You that You've accounted for our sins. Thank You for dying on the cross for our sins. Today, even as someone who's so hard on himself that in my humanity, You love me, Lord. We worship You today in Jesus' name.
King, all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I As we close our service today, I'm gonna to invite our altar ministry team down to the front. And if today you need someone to partner with you in prayer to maybe pray to receive Jesus for the first time, or maybe you are someone like who Pastor Max said, you have a hard time receiving this grace and you need someone to partner with you in prayer, we would love to pray with you. This team of people is filled with volunteers and pastors who pray for you all week for this exact moment. And maybe you need prayer for something that doesn't have anything to do with the message. And we'd love to pray for you for that as well. Before you go, I do have some announcements I wanna let you know. First of all, men's breakfast. You saw that commercial, eating all the food. Men's breakfast is coming up. You can get the information at gatewaypeople.com slash events. Men in the room, we'd love for you to come and be a part of men's breakfast. They're so fun. Breakfast burritos, come get involved in community. We'd love to have you there. The King's University, can we give it up one more time for the King's University today for being with us, Dr. Irene. If you want any information at all about the Kings, when you walk out these doors right before you leave the main entrance, you can go out to that booth and you can get all the information you need about the Kings University. Let me pray for you before we leave. God, thank you so much for being so good to us. Lord, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise today. God, we receive your grace and we declare that you are good in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.